Uh, well, um, welcome to the second part of the iBio seminar. Uh, this is titled Looking for Functional Drafts in Cell Membranes. Um, and I'm, uh, as you can see, Satyajit Mayer uh, from the National Center for Biological Sciences, uh, talking about some work that we have been doing in collaboration with a close colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Madan Rao, uh, at the Raman Research Institute, uh, also in Bangalore. Uh, he's a uh, soft uh, condensed matter physicist uh, with whom we have been trying to explore the structure of cell membranes. And in fact, parts two and three are uh, work that we've been doing in collaboration in an interdisciplinary way between uh, a cell biologist, myself, and a physicist, uh, uh, Madan Rao. Um, and the, the reason we have engaged in this collaboration, I think, uh, uh, should have in some ways been apparent from the, from, uh, the lessons we learned from part one where we examined uh, the uh, notion of membrane drafts and the operational criteria that have been used to look for membrane drafts in, in cells uh, and some of the problems associated with those criteria to look for drafts in cell membranes. Uh, now, um, what uh, we have uh, then um, uh, argued is that uh, while there are problems associated with the uh, operational criteria to look for rafts, uh, the cell membranes and cells themselves seem to be telling us that membrane uh, segregation or segregation of specific components uh, in the membrane of living cells must occur. Uh, and, the, uh, and, and the need of the hour then is our ways to look for these uh, segregated regions in cell membranes. Uh, so this part is, in fact, uh, our exploration of looking for these segregated regions in cell membranes uh, potentially imbued uh, with function. Um, well, the, the story in my laboratory, anyway, uh, starts with trying to understand the endocytic process. Um, and in cells, one of the best characterized means of endocytosis uh, is the, the one of uh, clathrin and dynamin dependent endocytosis, where these uh, components um, collaborate to make uh, membrane pits. Uh, and these pits then pinch off material at the cell surface, uh, bring them into the cell uh, as endocytic vesicles. Uh, and then these vesicles, um, are, uh, which are composed of, the, of, the, of components of the cell membrane encased in their, in their budding um, uh, in, the, in their budding uh, coats, uh, these components then move into the cell into, uh, to form uh, endocytic structures uh, which uh, contain uh, a fair representation of the components of the plasma membrane. For example, in this slide, uh, what you see are uh, transferrin uh, um, an iron binding protein bound to the transferrin receptor uh, shown in the green uh, fluorescent uh, image here, uh, and a lipoprotein LDL labeled in a, in a red uh, dye uh, coming into endosomes inside the cell uh, with, wherein they, they are present in the same endocytic uh, organelle. Uh, uh, the, the questions that we have asked are in fact uh, ones about what happens to the endocytosis of uh, the membrane components in, in general. Uh, so if you look at the underbelly of the plasma membrane, it, it looks uh, like this, uh, uh, something out of a, uh, a movie where you have, um, in fact, uh, it could be uh, any kind of a movie. It could be a, a horror movie or a, or a movie of, of, um, of uh, things on a Martian landscape where you have these fantastic organelles. In fact, this is a clathrin basket that you see here where the clathrin coats the membrane and in in, and makes the membrane pucker in to bring in components. Uh, and in this context, we, we want to ask the question about what happens to uh, membrane lipids and lipid anchored proteins when they get taken up uh, by the cell membrane. Um, GPI anchored proteins, as we had discussed in the first part, are an example of components of the membrane that uh, are 
in fact, what are some of the original reasons why the raft hypothesis was proposed, because they are sorted to different surfaces of the epithelial cell, the, pol the uh, apical uh, surface of an epithelial cell, uh, as opposed to being delivered to the basolateral. In the endocytic uh, process, we find that the GPI anchor proteins are also sorted. So at the cell surface, if we um, label GPI anchor proteins, uh, here um, we've expressed a folate receptor. Uh, so GPI anchor proteins come in many stripes and flavors. Uh, there are about 300 different types of GPI anchor proteins. Uh, many of them are receptors for small uh, small molecules. For example, the folate receptor is a GPI anchor protein in, in all um, mammalian systems. Um, the folate receptor brings in folates and, and we can uh, tag the folate receptor with a small molecule uh, ligand, the folate um, ligand, attached to a fluorophore. So it becomes easy to follow the folate receptor uh, as, as it uh, brings in this tagged fluorescent ligand into the cell. Um, so at the cell surface, the folate receptor, uh, if we uh, take cells that express the folate receptor, um, and we tag it with the small molecule ligand, at the cell surface, the folate receptor looks fairly um, uniformly distributed. Uh, and in the same cell, if we, if we uh, incorporate an exogenous uh, phospholipid, uh, now a fluorescently tagged uh, phospholipid, uh, a um, NBD, which is a fluorophore, a green fluorophore, uh, we um, tagged to a sphingolipid, uh, we find that, the, that this fluorophore is incorporated in the cell membrane, and when it's endocytosed, the two components of the membrane, the NBD labeled sphingomyelin, which is incorporated in the cell surface, and the folate receptor, they seem to segregate. The green uh, dots here indicate endosomes that are uh, enriched for the NBD lipid, and the red dots here indicate endosomes that are enriched for the GPI anchored folate receptor. So this suggests uh, that the, these two different types of lipids are sorted uh, at the cell surface and brought into endosomes um, perhaps by distinct uh, mechanisms. Um, in fact, at the cell surface, if we, if we look by uh, an electron micrograph, and this is an electron micrograph by uh, from a colleague of mine, Rob Parton, from the University of Queensland, uh, where he shows where that the GPI anchor proteins are, in fact, coming into the cell uh, via these long tubular invaginations that have, that have concentrated GPI anchor proteins in them. Uh, and work that we have done over the years has uh, revealed to us that GPI anchor proteins are endocytosed via a specialized endocytic pathway that's called the GEEK pathway uh, GP, for the GPI anchor protein enriched endosomal uh, compartments that they make. Uh, and these uh, pathways are in fact uh, a main means by which the cell seems to bring in a, a lot of the fluid that is also endocytosed into cells. Um, this pathway requires uh, the small molecule GTPase, CDC42, but, doesn't, but does not seem to require a host of other components that are necessary for uh, the, the clathrin and dynamin dependent uh, endocytic machinery. Um, instead, this pathway, which is a pinocytic pathway, bringing in fluid into the cell as well, uh, is rather lipid selective. It's lipid dependent. Um, it requires the small molecule GTPase uh, and is in fact very sensitive to the um, to perturbations of the actin cytoskeleton. Uh, but putting these uh, these characteristics of a GPI anchor protein together, the fact the fact that it's uh, sorted into a specialized endocytic pathway at the cell surface, while it lacks any kind of cytoplasmic extension, uh, is is telling us something. It's, it's telling us that these components must be somehow uh, segregated in the plane of the membrane to form uh, regions or domains where these molecules can be selectively endocytosed. So in, in other words, I think it's providing us an opportunity to look for uh, regions of the cell membrane that could be enriched in these, in these components, uh, which in, by all accounts would correspond to
uh, the functional uh, definition of a raft, regions of membranes imbued with function. So um, this is exactly what we've been trying to investigate. So uh, first of all, we, we know from work in our lab and other laboratories uh, that, there is, that, uh, the, the, that membrane rafts, uh, if they exist, must consist of some kind of a clustering of cholesterol and sphingolipids. And that they must be per platforms which allow the segregation of specific proteins um, uh, so that they can be sorted or, or, uh, or generate uh, signaling functions in, in specific lipid contexts. So how do we look for these rafts or these components of membranes which are, which are functional? Uh, well, one way and, uh, that people have looked for them are, are by this notion of this detergent resistant uh, extraction method, the DRM uh, uh, measurement. And as we discussed in the part one, there are a lot of problems associated with that uh, operational definition. So for, for the purpose of, of this uh, presentation, I think we, we, we should ignore that, uh, uh, that criteria. Uh, other measurements that have that have been done on on uh, to um, investigate the segregation of components in cell membranes are to ask questions about the diffusional characteristics of molecules in the plane of the membrane, uh, and if molecules enter regions where the uh, local environment of the membrane is more uh, liquid ordered, for example, uh, one would expect that components that are that are um, moving into these regions would slow down in their, in their mobility. And, and this uh, is one another means to investigate whether there are regions in cell membranes where uh, there are lateral segregations of components contributing to a ordering of lipids in, in the membrane. Um, we, uh, in our laboratory, have not looked at uh, these diffusion measurements, but I will come back to them in, in, the, in part three of this uh, seminar. Uh, uh, a method that we have used is ones based on trying to investigate the proximity between uh, components in the cell membrane and ask questions about uh, can we observe um, a coming together of, of these lipid uh, molecules in, in membranes of living cells uh, when uh, they are being endocytosed. Um, so to, to do that, we need to step back and have, as I said, a proper probe. Um, so these GPI anchored proteins is, uh, is uh, by all accounts, I, I, uh, a, a good way to investigate the uh, characteristics of segregation in the cell membrane because they are sorted in the plane of the cell membrane and they are endocytosed by these special specialized uh, uh, pathways. So do they exhibit any special uh, segregated distribution in the plane of the membrane? Um, and if they do, uh, what is the scale of those uh, segregated domains? So the first question we asked was simply ta by tagging the uh, GPI anchor proteins in uh, with, with a fluorescent dye. Um, again, the folate receptor, we tagged it with fluorescent folate. Uh, and uh, uh, imaged it using a confocal microscope. And, and what we found was that the, the molecules look uh, rather, rather boring. They look as if they're distributed uh, uniformly on the surface of the cell with some, some small speckles of, of these components that, that in fact correspond to little microvilli which you can see on the sides of these cells. Uh, so these, th this doesn't look like some uh, big raft or or big uh, segregated domain in the membrane, which could correspond to a uh, sorted site for endocytosis. So the, so the molecules at the scale of the fluorescence uh, micrograph, which is at the scale of optical resolution, uh, could be dispersed in a random fashion, or they could be dispersed in a fashion where the molecules are present as very small uh, aggregates in the cell membrane, way below the resolution of light. Uh, another analysis that we did was a, um, a crude sort of immunogold electron micrographic analysis, which also didn't reveal any large-scale clustering of these uh, proteins in the surface, at the surface of the cell membrane. So the gold particles that you see here in, in, a, in these golden arrows are, in fact, uh, um, look rather uniformly dispersed on the surface of the cell. Um, 
But below the resolution of light, one could in fact have uh, some, uh, uh, some aggregation of these components taking place. And to investigate that, um, different investigators have used uh, a variety of tools. So electron micrographic analysis coupled with some statistical analysis of the distribution of how the particles in the membrane has been one very successful approach that uh, Rob Parton and John Hancock have pioneered. Um, chemical cross-linking of components in situ is another, is another approach that uh, um, uh, Kurschalia and uh, um, uh, Chiara Zurzulo have, uh, have utilized very effectively. Uh, and we, on the other hand, have uh, tried to use a, uh, a sort of a non-perturbing approach uh, w where we, we try and observe the proximity between different gpi linked proteins uh, using uh, Foster's resonance energy transfer, which, or, rather, or um, in other words, FRET, uh, which is a technique that allows you to look at uh, proximity between two fluorophores. And I, I will explain some of the uh, tenets of this technique uh, in the next few slides. So the FRET um, uh, is a process in which energy is transferred from a, from a donor fluorophore uh, that uh, is excited by, fluorescent, by an excitation uh, light, it, and the energy is transferred to an acceptor fluorophore, uh, and that transfer of energy uh, results in the acceptor fluorophore uh, emitting light of a certain, uh, of a different wavelength. Uh, and this, the efficiency of this transfer can be measured by many means, uh, and the efficiency of this transfer is exquisitely sensitive to the distance between the two fluorophores. In fact, uh, the, the um, uh, efficiency of transfer is, is sensitive to the sixth power of the distance between the fluorophores. So if the fluorophore uh, changes by, a f the fluorophore distances change by a factor of 25%, the distance between the fluorophores changed by a factor of eight. I mean, the efficiency of energy transfer decreases by a factor of eight. So, so you have a very steep dependence of the uh, energy transfer efficiency with the uh, distance between the fluorophores. And a, and a scale that is used uh, in this measurement is, is a characteristic of the two chromophores that are uh, engaged in this energy transfer process. Um, the scale is called the Foster's radius, which is uh, a um, um, characteristic of of the uh, overlap of the, of the donor and acceptor fluorophores, um, and in fact um, uh, uh, serves as a, as a as kind of a spectroscopic ruler uh, to measure distances in the nanometer scale uh, in any uh, fluorescence uh, experiment. Uh, we have in fact used a variant of this type of FRET process to monitor the uh, distance between uh, fluorophores. This, this variant is called uh, HOMOFRET, uh, where we look at the energy transfer between two like fluorophores. And the way one can monitor the energy transfer between these uh, like fluorophores is, is by measuring the uh, emission anisotropy, or measuring the polarization of fluorescence emission emitted by uh, the um, a donor and acceptor fluorophores. Um, I'll explain this in a little, uh, in a little detail. Um, so if you have a fluorophore, for example, GFP, uh, green fluorescent protein, and excited with, the polarized, with polarized light, uh, the, the fluorophore is going to uh, emit uh, um, light in a polarized uh, fashion. And if you monitor the uh, the emission of fluorescence, uh, you will monitor a fairly polarized emission of fluorescence because GFP being a large molecule uh, doesn't allow the fluorophore in its excited state to rotate very far before it emits. So the only, uh, only uh, depolarization that one monitors is the uh, depolarization due to the arrangement of the fluorophores, uh, of these GFP fluorophores. If GFP was a very small molecule and were rotating very rapidly, the, uh, the emission anisotropy that was, uh, that was collected from the GFP fluorescence would be highly depolarized. Um, so rotation can depolarize the fluorescence uh, emission. Uh, and FRET can also depolarize the, uh, 
the fluorescence emission. So there are two GFP fluorophores very close together. Uh, they can transfer energy to each other. And in that transfer process, the uh, orientation of the uh, initial uh, excitation energy is, uh, is the orientation information is lost. And the energy transfer process itself leads to a depolarization of the fluorescence um, from uh, fluorophores that are engaged in um, close proximity. So the, by monitoring the extent of depolarization uh, due to uh, these two different types of processes, rotational and energy transfer, uh, if one can isolate these two different uh, uh, processes of depolarization, uh, one ends up with a very uh, sensitive measure of the FRET uh, phenomena. So we've used this technique, which is the um, monitoring the anisotropy of fluorescence from these uh, uh, fluorescently tagged GPI anchored proteins uh, to ask whether they are present in close, close proximity to their neighbors. So for this, for this um, type of um, an experiment, we take uh, uh, Chinese hamster ovary cells and transfect them with a, the with a uh, uh, with a fluorescent uh, liti fluorescent um, uh, G GPI anchored protein, for example, GFP tagged to a GPI anchoring signal, or a uh, monomeric uh, YFP tagged to a GPI anchoring signal, or our favorite uh, molecule, the folate receptor. And, and monitor the, and then excite these fluorophores with polarized light, and then monitor the uh, anisotropy of fluorescence emission. So the first thing that we observe is that these, uh, the anisotropy of the, um, ex, uh, the emission is uniform across a, a field of cells which have very widely varying, uh, um, very widely varying fluorescence um, intensity uh, indicating widely varying uh, protein levels in the cell membranes. So across a, uh, a range of protein expression in the cell membrane, we monitor a value of anisotropy from different cell uh, populations. Uh, and this anisotropy is quite depolar depolarized uh, for the different GPI anchored proteins that we have, we have uh, transfected into cells. And it, in fact, it is, um, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, that depolarization is sensitive to the perturbation of cholesterol in the cell membrane. So if you remove cholesterol from the cell membrane uh, using a variety of different means, uh, we see a rise in the fluorescence and isotropy, indicating that we are uh, somehow losing the FRET uh, component of this fluorescence and isotropy um, me measurement. And the, and the uh, fluorescence and isotropy now rises to a value which corresponds to uh, isolated fluorophores uh, that are present in, in cell membranes. Uh, so this sort of an experiment immediately uh, tells us that the GPI anchor proteins cannot be organized in a, in a uh, random arrangement in cell membranes where they do not see their neighbors. In fact, they must be organized in an arrangement where uh, there are uh, optically unresolvable clusters of proteins where this energy transfer process must be taking place. Um, and what we have been able to show is that this FRET process arises from uh, an extremely high density packing of these uh, fluorescently tagged GPI anchored proteins in membranes of cells. Uh, this high density packing is something that we have been able to uh, uncover using uh, a time-dissolved fluorescence and isotropy measurement. Um, uh, the, the details of these, of these measurements um, are, are uh, quite complex, and, and I think uh, they are perhaps better re re referred to uh, papers from uh, our laboratory. Um, but um, but what, what we've been able to show using these time-dissolved fluorescence and isotropy measurements is that the GPI anchor proteins uh, the, at least the species that exhibit the fret or close proximity are present in incredibly close uh, uh, um, distances from each other, between each other. They are present in around uh, four nanometer separation between each other. The two GPI anchor proteins, uh, in, in this case, let's say two GFP molecules, which are three nanometers in size on their own, are within 
four nanometers of each other. The centers of these proteins are within four nanometers of each other. So they're almost close packed, they're almost touching. Um, but, but that still doesn't tell us what size these structures of these fret uh, competent species um, are. What is the size of their structures? Are they uh, a few nanometers? Are they uh, tens of molecules or are they hundreds of molecules? Because all of that will still fit within the uh, optical resolution of, of, a, of a microscope, which is about 300 nanometers. Uh, so some clues to understanding the structure of these, uh, of these uh, fret competent species in cell membranes came in fact from another type of experiment where we were monitoring the fluorescence and isotropy of these uh, folate receptors uh, labeled with fluorescently, uh, fluorescein tagged uh, to the folate ligand. Um, and when we mo uh, monitor the uh, fluorescence and isotropy of these folate uh, receptors, they, uh, uh, the, the, the fluorophores seem to get bleached. And when they bleach, their fluorescence and isotropy simply rises up the scale uh, in, in very systematic steps. So if you bleach the fluorophores by 50%, they, the fluorescence and isotropy rises by uh, a, a given value. If you re bleach it again by 50%, it changes by uh, another systematic uh, value. Um, and in fact, the, our interpretation is that if you have small clusters of these molecules, they, when they bleach, they, within the clusters you see some change in the, uh, in, in the uh, uh, distances between these different uh, components. So what we try to do is uh, try and, and make theoretical models for these, uh, for these structures. Um, we've uh, made two types of models at two different scales. One at the scale where the, the domains that these molecules uh, form are much larger than the Foster's radius, which is the scale of our uh, fluorescence energy transfer experiment. Um, and the other model is, is a model where the fluorescence, uh, the fluorophores are distributed in a much smaller scale uh, on the scale of the Foster's radius. But first look, let's look at the uh, model where we've looked at the change of fluorescence and isotropy in, uh, in uh, a model where um, the fluorophores are distributed in domains which are much larger than the uh, Foster's radius. Uh, so, so what we've done is, is we've, uh, uh, we've cre created a, 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 a situation where we've uh, arranged fluorophores in, diff in these arrangements and then bleached them. And in each of these conditions, we've calculated the uh, extent of anisotropy um, change we'd expect uh, from fluorophores that were in fret distances from each other. And, and what we find is, in fact, that no, none of the models that, are, uh, that uh, have a size that's much larger than the Foster's radius uh, are able to describe the data that uh, we have generated from this photobleaching uh, perturbation of anisotropy. So for example, if we, if we look at the change in uh, fluorescence uh, intensity as a function of the bleaching process, as we move uh, left across this uh, screen, uh, what we find is that uh, the, the fluorescence and isotropy you know, creeps up the scale. And the different models that we have um, for, for domains that are much larger than the Foster's radius fail to fit the, uh, the um, observed experimental uh, values of anisotropy. In fact, the only model that, uh, correspond, that fits this uh, observed uh, change is a model where the density of the fluorophores in the domains is very, very low. Um, but, the den but the measured density that we have uh, um, uh, for these fluorophores in these domains is, is in fact that of molecular separations on the order of four nanometers. Uh, and, and those, uh, if we put those numbers in, we, we fail to fit the data that we get from the experiment. But the model that best fits the experiment is a model that looks like this where we have very tiny clusters, three or four or maybe five molecules in size, which in fact, uh, which in fact are present in, uh, in a small, in a low abundance in the context of a large number of monomers. So in this type of a, an experiment, we find that 
the, the, the theoretical model perfectly fits the experimental uh, data. And, the, and using some of the fit parameters, we, we have been able to come up with the structure of these fret uh, competent species in the cell membrane. And it looks like this, that, the, that these GPI anchor proteins are arranged in, uh, in predominantly in the form of monomers. And a small fraction, between 20 and 40 percent, are present as these little nano clusters. Um, not only that, experiments using this sort of a technique, uh, I think, uh, have allowed us to ask questions about uh, the properties of these uh, nano clusters. Uh, one thing that we we have been able to show is that the, uh, that multiple uh, uh, GPI anchored species can cohabit one uh, nano cluster. So if you have many different uh, GPI anchor proteins, they, and you, if you monitor the fluorescence and isotropy from one of these species, the um, fluorescence and isotropy, uh, um, in fact, is, uh, is perturbed by the presence of the other species. Uh, and, and that indicates that multiple or many different GPI species can cohabit in the same uh, little nano cluster. Um, so the GPI anchor proteins in cell membranes then um, are organized as monomers and mixed nanoclusters in cell membranes. Uh, another feature of this organization is that it is flexible. Um, if we uh, selectively perturb one of the uh, GPI anchor proteins by cross-linking them with antibodies, for example, uh, these, uh, the other GPI anchor proteins which, uh, which do not get cross-linked by, um, by an antibody, which is, let's say, able to recognize the green GPI anchor proteins versus the red ones, uh, the, 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 re the red ones now reorganize to, uh, to a distribution that would have corresponded to, uh, uh, a, to um, a situation where they do not see the, the green ones. So the, the GPI anchor proteins seem to be flexibly organized, and they ca their organization can be perturbed or changed and altered when, uh, when you um, uh, do something to these proteins that, that uh, moves them laterally away from these uh, pre-existing structures. So they are, in other words, flexibly organized as monomers and mixed nanoclusters. Um, they are concentration independent, and I think this is a very important property of these uh, GPI anchor proteins. That if you look at these GPI uh, at different uh, concentrations of GPI anchor proteins in cell membranes, this the fraction of clusters that are present is independent of the concentration of these GPI anchor proteins in the cell membrane. They are cholesterol sensitive, and I think the, the you, know, um, you know given these properties, you know people who are not interested in GPI anchor proteins might say, well, so what? Uh, you're looking at GPI anchor proteins, and what you're seeing is a characteristic of these molecules, and you know, maybe there's something special about GPI anchor proteins. But I think what I'd like to show you now is some uh, experiments that have been done on other lipid anchored uh, molecules. For example, the, the RAS uh, uh, protein. Uh, the RAS is an inner leaflet um, lipid anchored molecule, and the RAS molecule is one of the key players in oncogenic uh, transformation of cells. Uh, and it's the way it interprets growth factor signals from the outside uh, uh, determines, in many cases, the, the uh, ability of a cell to pro proliferate or, 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 uh, uh, or continue to grow or stop growing. Um, so the, so and, and the organization of that uh, RAS molecule uh, uh, has been um, a, a matter of great uh, interest and contention because it seems to dictate the outcome of the signaling process through the gro through growth factor signaling, um, and and uh, from from some experiments that uh, John Hancock and his colleagues have done, uh, they have been able to show that the the RAS proteins are also clustered in the inner leaflet of cells, uh, in small less than ten nanometer clusters, uh, which are cholesterol dependent concentration independent, and in fact sensitive to perturbations of the actin cytoskeleton. And the organization of these components in the membrane are in, important for their, the kind of oncogenic signaling that they uh, give rise to.
So, uh, so it is not only the RAS proteins that are, that are present in these small nano cluster type uh, organizations. Um, in fact, the, the RAS proteins have um, told us that perhaps uh, if, if you, if you cross-link GPI anchor proteins, the, RAS, the organization of the RAS proteins seem to be influenced by the, by the cross-link GPI anchor proteins. If you cross-link GPI anchor proteins, the RAS proteins seem to come in, uh, the clusters of the RAS proteins seem to come in, uh, sit beneath these clustered GPI anchored uh, um, flotilla that are, beneath, that are present on the exoplasmic side of the cell membrane. Uh, and, and this, in some ways, seems to be revealing a, a coupling of, of the outer leaflet of the bilayer, where the GPI anchored proteins are sticking their heads out, uh, with the inner leaflet of the bilayer, where the RAS molecules are, are, uh, are situated. Um, other glycolipids, which, which are uh, lipids that have um, different sorts of gangliosides, are, um, or uh, silyl groups on them also exhibit a similar nanocluster distribution, which is sensitive to cholesterol and, uh, con and is concentration independent. So together, it seems that multiple lipid anchor proteins um, and di different types of lipids are uh, organized as monomers and nanoclusters. Uh, and this sort of organization seems to be a, uh, a, a very general characteristic of of membrane components in, in living cells. Uh, so where does this leave us in terms of the endocytosis of GPI anchored proteins? Um, in, so in the, specifically in the context of GPI anchored proteins, uh, what, what we have uh, tried to do is ask what role do these nanoclusters play in the endocytosis of these uh, GPI anchored proteins? And what we find, and this is, this is experiments that we've done uh, by uh, perturbing the organization of these GPI anchor proteins by this cross-linking uh, 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 trick. Uh, when we cross-link the GPI anchor proteins, we find that, these, that the red uh, GPI anchor proteins, which are not cross-linked, uh, continue to be endocytosed by the distinct endocytic pathway that GPI anchor proteins seem to be marking, whereas the cross-linked GPI anchor proteins are segregated from this uh, endocytic pathway and move into uh, other pathways of endocytosis. So it appears that the, the little nanoclusters of GPI anchor proteins uh, may act as sorting uh, signals or signals for inclusion or, and perhaps signals for exclusion from uh, different pathways of endocytosis. Um, and, and this, um, in, in some ways, brings us to formulate some kind of a, 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 a hypothesis about what of what kinds of arrangements these GPI anchor proteins may be uh, getting into to, uh, to, disc to um, mark different endocytic uh, routes or maybe generate new endocytic routes. So one hypothesis that we have is that these little nanoclusters of GPI anchor proteins may, may uh, on their own not have very much functional significance, but when they uh, are brought together and form larger scale domains, uh, where many of these nanoclusters come together and form uh, little, uh, uh, little rafts of nanoclusters, if you want to call them that, those structures are functional entities which, uh, which could be endocytosed uh, by these distinct endocytic uh, mechanisms. Um, well, the evidence that we have at the, uh, at the end of this part of the lecture is, is um, that we can uh, we have um, uh, uh, strong proof that these nanoclusters of these lipid anchor molecules exist. Uh, whether they form larger domains or not uh, uh, remains to be seen. Um, so in a way, uh, the study of these GPI anchor proteins, lipid anchor components in the outer and the inner leaflet, have uh, revealed to us a a working hypothesis of what could be a functional domain in cell membranes. Uh, one where I'd imagine that small clusters of GPI anchor proteins are somehow brought together in an, uh, or induced into a larger domain, which is then capable of specific sorting or signaling function. And, and this, this is a very different model from uh, the model of phase segregation of components giving rise to a raft, uh, because it suggests that there are uh, mechanisms involved in 
maintaining uh, a pre-existing structure, mechanisms involved in generating a new type of structure uh, which has specific uh, function. Uh, and, um, and, and the characteristics of the, of the structures of GPI anchored proteins, I think, um, uh, and these other lipid anchored molecules uh, suggest a very different type of, of mechanism to generate uh, these, these structures, different from a uh, equilibrated uh, phase separation type mechanism where we'd expect the concentration of the clusters to be sensitive in some form uh, to the concentration of the, of the monomers in the membrane. Um, so, uh, uh, so the questions that these, um, these uh, observations raise uh, obviously are what makes uh, these nanoclusters and, and what induces, if there are any, uh, if, if, if at all, the domains that are imbued with uh, function at a larger scale. Um, well, I think uh, uh, the similarities in properties between all these different lipid anchored molecules uh, suggest similar mechanisms for the formation of these clusters of GPI anchored proteins, RAS proteins, and uh, glycolipids. And it is unlikely that a passive mechanism involving thermodynamic phase separation is going to account for these type of structures. Instead, I think we may need a new proposal for, for understanding the, the formation of these complexes in, in cell membranes, a new proposal for the structure of the membrane to understand the formation of these uh, structures in the cell membrane. And part three is going to try and, uh, um, and, and explore some ideas behind this new proposal for the structure of the plasma membrane.